Bonjour. It's uh, really great to be here again in Paris. Uh, I think my, my most favorite city in the whole world is here. And what an amazing night it was uh, to see all this fantastic stuff going on in the streets. Uh, people uh, shouting and waving and celebrating and having the most amazing fun. And uh, I wonder if I could have my slides in the, uh, in the monitors here at, at my feet. Thank you. Uh, and I want to uh, talk about the future. F-U-T-U-R-E spells the word future. F-U-T-U-R-E. And uh, the first face I will come to in a moment. But before I do, you know, as technology people, as people who control the IT systems inside many of the largest banks in the world, inside insurers, inside telcos, inside uh, pharmacy companies, you are creating the future. You are always living on the outer edge of this radar, as I am. And you know the problem, which is that the corporate strategy of your organization is usually working at the center. And uh, the challenge is to bring these two worlds together, especially when the world is changing very fast. I want to suggest to you that the entire future of technology, even of human history, will be shaped by one single word. It's not innovation. It's not economics. It's not politics. What is this word? It's not demographics. Let me tell you a story. Uh, the other day, I was uh, a little bit late uh, to arrive at the uh, speaking platform where I was about to give a keynote. I was waiting for the lift. I was pressing the button. I was just standing there. I didn't know what to do. For a moment, I was tempted to do something totally crazy. I was actually tempted to press that lift button more than once. Now, I know that you would never, ever do such a crazy thing. <laughs> okay. Put your hands up if you have thought about to do it. I know that you would never do it, but you have considered for a moment actually touching that button twice. Okay. How put your hands up if you actually did it. Okay. Uh, put your hands up if you talk to the lift. Come on. <laughs> I mean, what's it? Even Bill Gates knows you cannot reorganize the programming of the lift unless you're a hacker. But you cannot hack the lift by pressing the button. But we still do it. Put your hands up if you talked to your car at the weekend. <laughs> I fly a lot. I'm very interested in planes. And uh, I asked 600 airline pilots this question. Put your hands up if you talk to the plane. They all do. They all talk, come on, baby, it's time to go. We all talk up. Along and down. <laughs> what do we learn about the future? We learn, my friends, that the most important thing is this. That we are rational, intelligent, analytical, IT-loving IT human beings. But you put us in a small amount of pressure and we behave completely irrationally. And the most important word that will drive the future in the use of IT is not innovation or technology, it's emotion. It's the word which has driven all of human history. It's not events, it's reactions to them which cause the real changes that take place in our world. And, uh, you know, we we'll see this emotion as a big driver that spins this cube fast is about the speed of change. Things happen. Uh, all kinds of things happen. And big events take place which can transform strategy in an instant. Here is an event which took place in 20 seconds. An earthquake. Following this, there was another 20-second event. A crack in a nuclear reactor. As a result of that, energy policy changed in Germany for 40 years. 40 seconds to change energy policy across the whole of the European Union, actually, for 40 years. The same in Japan, the same in the United States of America. But how long does it take to change an IT strategy in a world where when you merge two big banks and it takes 
eight years just to fix the IT problems of the past. So we have to think totally differently about IT strategy in the future if we are to keep pace with this scale of change. We need a much more agile way of thinking about strategy itself. The days of having only one strategy are over. We need to have a plan B, plan C, plan D. We know what will happen if. We need to make sure that IT capability is fused into corporate thinking at the most senior level. Now, I just want to make a brief comment about the global economy and to make an observation. Watching too much TV news can make you sick because it's not the truth. What, what is the truth? Here is the truth. 1980 through to 2013, if you look at the global economy, which is the world, the orange line, you see that we never stopped growing. We stopped for about three months. But human history will show that the global economy continued to power from strength to strength throughout the first 100 years of the third millennium. Yes, of course, there was pain in our part of the world, but we are recovering. Uh, but look here, this is Vietnam. Can you spot the crisis? 1985 through to 2011, where is the crisis? There. Vietnam is a country with half the wage level of China. And Vietnam is a country which has just won the opportunity to build a $1 billion chip factory for Intel because China manufacturing is so last century. China is too expensive. We'll come back to that. 40% of the world's GDP will be in Asia by 20. 15. Some say that on purchasing power parity, it may be that China is already the world's largest economy. It is completely untrue to talk about the rise of emerging markets. This is not true. What we're seeing is a rebalancing of history, a rebalancing that will take place over the next 100 years and will last 300 years. We're talking about China and India being one third of humanity. They used to be one third of the wealth of humankind. And then the Industrial Revolution came in Europe and there was a technological advantage for a short time, around 150 years. And now we are rebalancing again. So we're talking about a fundamental realignment of economic power, and we see it everywhere. The Chinese government is sitting on $3.4 trillion of cash, mainly US government bonds. And they will move that money into your companies, buying things, uh, because there are better things to do with that money than keep it in US government bonds. At the same time, we have $2.4 trillion of money sitting in the bank accounts of large corporations. This too is ready to be spent. And there is another $3 trillion of cash sitting around in other places. We're talking about a mountain of economic opportunity which will come back into Europe, into Asia, into American economies and will drive growth and inflation, you can be sure, and a huge acceleration of change. Now, I want to make one other comment about the speed of change from the technology point of view. You know, the web has made us and our clients incredibly impatient. Let me give you an example. Imagine last night to beat the train strike, you came to Paris and stayed in a hotel. So last night you're watching the TV and you see the name of an actor and you type in her name into Google and you go to her web page to find out how old she is. How long do you wait before you get tired of waiting for the page to load and you press the back button? You press the button on Google. Put your hands up if you press the back button in less than five seconds because life's too short to wait. 
So most people in Paris, if you remember nothing at all about the future, remember this about the present. What you have told me today is that most people in Paris are out. They are irritated in two seconds. In three, they think there is a fundamental problem. In four, they want to kill the designer of the web page. <laughs> After five, they have lost the will to live and they have gone. 95% of your business on your banking website is lost in five seconds. You have just shown me this. You say, no, no, they're still on my website. Yes, but in what psychological state? <laughs> the web has made us very impatient. If this is true, this five-second test is true of, of, of Paris as a whole, we have to completely rethink how we engage with our customers. I'm not now talking only about your retail customers on a website. I'm talking about your internal customers on a helpline trying to get help. Here's another example. My wife is trying to get money back from our electricity company because they have stolen a thousand euros from us. So she phones them up and uh, she, uh, she gets through to a machine. Uh, ding dong, ding dong, your call is very important to us. Ding dong, ding dong. Press one for accounts, press two for customer services. Put your hands up if you think that is extremely rude and annoying. Uh, put your hands up if you think it is so bad that it should be a social crime in France and uh, people should be put in prison who install such systems. <coughs> Okay, now you know what's coming next. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass you. Perhaps I should. Okay, we are amongst friends. Put up your hands if your own company uses such a system. Come on! What happened? What happened is we were wearing the wrong glasses, the wrong pair of glasses when we made the IT decision. We forgot that the future is about emotion. We forgot that even rational CIOs in F Paris today become extremely irrational in less than five seconds. We forgot that when people phone, they are already in a problem. They have lost money. The bank account doesn't work. The, the, the insurance company has yet to acknowledge their email. They have just lost their car or burnt their house. And now they're getting through to a robot. So what I'm saying is this. Let's think that little things make a huge difference in the future. And by the way, uh, looking around the average age here, <laughs> Let's go down 20 years. Let's think of those who are maybe 15 years old or 20 years old. How many seconds do they wait before they press the back button? <laughs> Two and a half. And by the way, what about you? In five years' time, how many seconds will you wait? 95% of you are gone in five seconds. But in 220? I suggest it will be in two seconds. In 220, I suggest that in your children's cases, it will be less than one second. Because one second is long enough to lose the will to live. My friends, we need to completely rethink this area of responsiveness, and it doesn't cost much to do it. I'll give you a small example. Email is so last century, I don't know why we use it anymore. A voice is, 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 of course, appalling. There's only one way to communicate with a close friend, which is... <laughs> Let me see. Imagine a terrible thing happens at the school where your child is, and you have to collect this child immediately, but your wife is out of the country or your husband is out of the country. How will they get the message to you right now? SMS. SMS. SMS is the only technology we really take attention to. But SMS is the, therefore the most important technology for people we really want to work with, for our team members, for our clients, our customers, uh, communicating from the website to confirm the purchase. SMS. It costs nothing, but it's very easy to do. Here's another example. Put your hands up if you have a voice to text system on your phone. So your voice messages go automatically to text. It's magic, isn't it? Because you can be in the busiest meeting, you can be in a board meeting. You have six or seven phone calls, but each one of them, as you're sitting there, is being converted to text. You have the text there. 
At the same time, it's been sent by email to your office. Your colleagues have got it. You know exactly what's going on. I'm saying the very simple technologies can change huge things at work, and we spend a fortune developing very sophisticated tools which no one likes or uses, and there are little things we can do to make a huge difference. Fast, urban. Urban is about demographics, fashions, fads, and lifestyles. Urban is about one billion young people alive today under the age of 18. All of them will be your customers in the next five to 10 years, or 15 years. And where they live will shape the direction of human history. 300 million people will move to cities in China in the next 15 years. Another 475 million will move to cities in Africa in the same period. But in many European countries, except France, you now need eight great-grandparents to produce a single great-grandchild. Because if you only have one child per couple, that is what happens. You either have to make babies, or you have to import them. <laughs> In the UK, we forgot how to do this a long time ago, which is why we have two policies on immigration in my country. We have officially, keep them out. Unofficially, don't count them when they come. But if we think about what's happening in the job market, it's hugely important. In Italy, there will be one million people over the age of 90. Some of them will be in the workforce by 2026. One million. Look what's happening to engineering graduates, and I could show you the same statistics for software development. Uh, this is uh, uh, maths, engineering, those kinds of qualifications. Just look where the graduates are coming from. This is China each year. This is India, US, Brazil, UK, Japan. China and India between them are completely dominating the production of software, IT, engineering, mathematics. Demographics is also about aging. It's about science to stop the ticking of the clock. Can we do it? As a physician, I say that we probably can, yes. Uh, we are able to grow new teeth for you if you have one that falls out. We can use cells from your own body. We can repair your own brain, your spinal cord, and your heart. Uh, the future is about performance. It's not about health. And, you know, we have ways to help people think better. One in five students in the UK and the US, maybe as many in Paris too, one in five students are now using drugs for Alzheimer's, memory loss, and things like that, they're, but they're using them to pass their exams. We are re-engineering performance. In future, we will need anti-doping tests, not in the Olympics, but in the examination hall. We have monkeys that are living to a human equivalent age of around 150 years old. And we're just starting. We are studying whales, which live to the age of 200. And they don't seem to show any kind of aging process. We cannot find any biological ticking clock inside them. There are other whales that die in 10 years or 20 years. What's the difference? They look exactly the same. The difference, my friends, is in the genetic code. And in their genes is a secret which stops them from getting old. They die of lots of other things, but they never age. And if we find the gene, we can find the protein. We can give the protein as a medicine and maybe re-engineer you too. Fast, urban. Tribalism, the T of the future, is the most powerful force in the world today. Tribalism is about football, about teams, about nationalism, about belonging. It's about culture. It's about brands. It's about social media. It's about belonging. It's why cities are doing so well. There are some futurists 10 or 20 years ago who predicted the death of cities like Paris. How stupid. They said we would all be teleworking at home. And we would all choose to live in Bordeaux and, or beautiful rural areas in the Loire Valley. And no one would actually want to work in a Paris office anymore. Absolute nonsense. 
Why? Because we are tribal people. We love to be together. We love the buzz, the excitement of being in places like the Bors. Something happens when we breathe the same air, electricity and energy is created. We are transformed by groups, by being together with people. So, teleworking, yes, we are all telework, of course, at three in the morning when the email goes, or doing a video conference at home at six. I'm not talking about that. But the complete removal of people from the traditional workforce is not happening. And people don't like video conference, actually. Um, it's interesting. All of us have video on our phones. Put your hands up if you have used the video to make a video call on your phone in the last three months. Okay, about 10%. Uh, put your hands up if those calls were for family. Put your hands up if you use video on a call for work. Very few. Okay, so five to one, family, to work. Um, put your hands up if you've done a traditional video conference in the last three months at work. Put your hands up if you really enjoyed it and are looking forward to doing it again soon. What happened? What happened to all these IT systems which you so wonderfully designed and budgeted and built? The answer is no one uses them. Why is that? You can see why. They hate it. <laughs> you see, you can have all the innovation in the world, but if it doesn't connect with emotion, nothing happens. The reason why people don't like video at work, do you know why? It's because we leak data. When, uh, my, my, uh, I'm a grandfather now. Our granddaughter is nine months old, and she has just learned to crawl, and she can now move from one stage end to the other in less than three seconds. Okay, and this is exciting to watch. Video is amazing. A video clip, yes, great. But even more amazing is to say, hi, Alice. Whoa, <laughs> look at that. Alice, at the age of 12 weeks, knew that people lived in the iPad. She knew that if she touched the iPad, they smiled. So video is amazing. But what's really interesting is what else I see. So Alice is is crawling along and I say, oh, you painted the kitchen. I like the color. But in the work situation, we do not want this leakage. So you be very careful. You're about to do a video call. You think, oh, I move the camera because otherwise they'll see the washing up in the sink. <laughs> Emotion. Emotion. Fast, urban, tribal, tribal... Universal. Universal, that's the opposite of tribalism. It's globalization. It's English language everywhere. McDonald's. In Place du Tetre. Starbucks. And Montmartre. It's the loss of culture. But also it's about scale. And I want to suggest to you that if you're, a, if you're running the IT of a bank, there's a very big question. With the size of your bank at the moment, even if you are one of the largest European banks, are you actually big enough to have a large enough IT budget to be able to cope with all the changes that are needed? I think not. My guess is that you have an IT budget of 700 million euros, maybe 800 million euros. And a lot of that is simply legacy. But how much is there for innovation? Salesforce is a cloud-based sales platform for call centers. Salesforce's own R&D budget, just for call center technology, is around $3.4 billion a year. That's why people are using them, because they are able to fix the problem. They are able to incorporate social media tools. So when, when, when I'm talking to someone on a call center, they can see, oh, this is Patrick Dixon. He has 42,000 people on Twitter, and he has just tweeted about me. And they can see influence. They can see the home that I live in. They can see the likely value of my income and my assets. They can see uh, the, my website and my LinkedIn profile. They have scores and all kinds of stuff pouring in to contextualize that phone call. 
in ways that would be very difficult for every single bank here separately to develop. You might say, well, how can we do this? Because if we combine our IT solutions with another bank, we will breach all kinds of regulatory issues and um, what happens to our own intellectual property. You can do it. Go and partner with a huge bank in Singapore or a national bank in Mexico. But let's not reinvent all this stuff because life's too short. And the, te the technology challenge just to deal with hacking, for example, and security issues is overwhelming now, even for big banks in Europe. Now, when we talked in the past about these things, we would outsource. But as I predicted 10 years ago, I said the outsourcing days are over. We need to think about bringing it back. Why? Because of price. It's too expensive. 11% wage inflation in China this year and last year has eroded the last piece of outsourcing econ economics for many manufacturers. That's why they're bringing jobs back to France, Mexico, Germany, Britain, US, I just want to look at the uh, e-commerce e and uh, the whole change of retail in this universal globalized world. In many EU countries, up to 70% of all spending is now in seven companies only, and the process is still consolidating. If we look at e-commerce, this year we will see $1.5 trillion traded online. In France, this is growing at 13.5% per year. It's $50 billion a year. Already in the UK, we're talking about 12% of all retail spending. We are only in the first five minutes of the first hour of digital. When the, this conference is held in the year 2050, we will look back and we will say that e-commerce didn't start until 2025. People were talking about it in 2014, but we didn't really understand it. 2020, it's we started to take off. 225, that's when we really got going with e-commerce. A complete, radical, total transformation. This is just experimenting. Here is an experiment in the UK this month. For the first time, over 50% of all transactions online will be conducted using a mobile device. Why is that important? I'll tell you why. It's already happened in places like Brazil, in uh, Singapore, in Kenya. Why? Because they jumped straight from nothing to smartphones in one go. In Europe, we are so far behind. In Europe, we are now becoming mobile dominated. Only now. But what it means is that in the future, forget about everything online using a fixed device or even a mobile computer. Online will be entirely mobile. Forget about the rest. It's almost incidental. Nothing worthwhile thinking about. Totally mobile. And the reason why that matters is because the most important single thing you need to know, therefore, is where is the person right now? Where are they transacting? Not what page are they visiting, but where are they physically? Because this tells us how they are feeling. That's why location-based marketing is the next big thing. The most important fact you need to know for every visitor on your website is not just the device, platform, operating system, resolution, but most importantly, where are they? Even better, where were they 10 minutes ago? And then you can use big data and predict where they will be in 10 minutes' time and how many of your products you might be able to sell them. It's all a question of predictive forces. Uh, here is someone, a male or female, working at home. Male? Female? What do you think? I think male. <laughs> okay. Now, he's been absent for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, actually. Where is he at the moment? Toilet, yes. <laughs> no. What is he doing in there? Doing his email? No, I think he's on the phone. I think his boss called him. <laughs> okay, put your hands up. If you have been in the toilet and someone called you, it was so important, you thought, oh, what do I do? <laughs> I answer the phone. Put your hands up if you've answered the phone. You're in the toilet. Come on. Did they know? <laughs> it's 
actually the most important thing is understand where they are. What are they doing? Then you know what to do. Next. Look at this. This is really exciting. This is a complete fusion of online, offline. Uh, you know, retail is in total chaos in France at the moment. It's the same in, in, in the UK. And retailers don't know what to do. They don't know whether they're offline retailers or online retailers or mobile retailers. So here I am. I'm researching a product. I'm just about to buy my wife a birthday present, except I'm not at home. I'm actually walking around the store buying my wife a birthday present. I'm clicking on it, getting a comparative price. As so I'm in the store buying it for delivery at home. Or I'm at home buying it for delivery in the store. Or I'm at home in the store. No, I'm actually, I'm in a competitor. And I'm ordering it from another competitor to be delivered to the petrol station on the way home. All the metro ticket offices in my country are being closed, just like here. <laughs> Why? Because they're going to become click and collect facilities instead for e-commerce. You see, it's growing quite quickly. In the UK, we have a problem. This year, we have to deliver 1.3 billion packages to people at home, except they are not at home. They're never at home. They're either working, or they are traveling, or they're on holiday, or they're out with their friends. So we have to find a new place to deliver it. So the idea of e-commerce at home, order a product to be delivered at home, it's finished. It's mobile wherever someone is, and collected mobile wherever someone is. So I say, uh oh, okay, actually, I really want it delivered to me now. Mm -mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I need a new battery for my, I need actually a new power cable for my Mac, and I have, um, uh, you'll have to come and find me. There's my app, it shows my location, just send a courier. And the courier comes, finds me, and here it is. We have to completely rethink these things. It's about the Internet of Things locating every single object on the face of this earth. Internet of Things. So many people talk about it. They also talk about big data. You know, it means absolutely nothing unless it creates customer magic. That's the test. It has to create an amazing experience for some customer internally or externally or close the program down. And it's the same for big data, I have to say. Uh, talking of big data, uh, here is a big way to get some big data. Retail payments. Now, let's have a look at this. Just consider, where, is the, where are most mobile payments taking place in the whole world? You know the answer to that. Of course, it's in Africa. Africa is the leader of all things to do with banking. Kenya. One third of Kenya's entire economy is traded using the M-Pesa platform. And we are only in the first 20 seconds of the first minute of digital in Africa. All my retail banking clients are watching Africa carefully, especially my Asian clients, because they are now seeing the African experiment jump all the way into Asian countries. My European banking clients are thinking, is uh, what on earth is going to happen to banking in Europe if telcos and banks become one, as they will? Now, here is an interesting graph. You see, Moore's law tells us that costs of telco and uh, IT and everything from, in your business is falling to zero. And uh, the law of mobile payments is that uh, the amount of money that we can capture in commissions and charges and loans and interests and insurance products, the amount of value we can create by moving all payments onto the smartphone is so huge that at one point these two lines will cross and when they do, an amazing event happens. You see, uh, the event might be a bit, a bit like this. You see, uh, what is your name? Michael. Michelle. So, Michelle... Uh, here's the deal for you. I say, Michelle, I will give you uh, 
Uh, so you're using a mobile phone. I, get, I will give you uh, one smartphone for you, one for your partner. I will change them every 12 months for free. I will also give you two large smart pads of your own choice. I will give you um, a, a replacement for whatever mobile laptop you like. I will give you two of them. I will give you free broadband at home, and I want you to stop your movie packages at home, your satellites, your cable TV, stop it all, because I will give you more movies than you can possibly watch. Every TV channel in the world will be free. I'm going to give you unlimited video calls across the European Union. And I'll give you some cap on international, but almost everything will be free. Everything is free. Just sign. And you say, yes, but what's the catch? And I say, Michelle, just take out your wallet, please. He's really worried now. <laughs> he thinks he's going to lose some money. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is fat. <laughs> Woof. Now, this is, you, you see, I've, I've got the right person here. This is full of plastic. <laughs> see, what we're going to do now. See, there's no trick in this. I, 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 I don't want you to. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I won't take this any further. But I would be asking you to remove one card and say, this is my emergency card and I will be allowed to spend up to 800 euros a month on this card, but all the rest goes on your smartphone, okay? Smartphone, everything else on here. And from this moment, we shake hands, and everything is happy. Thank you, Thank you. okay. <laughs> Give him a round of applause, thank you. Okay, now, what, is, what has happened here? What has happened here has completely revolutionized retail banking, it's the end of telcos, it's the end of mobile phone contracts. It's the end of the entertainment information industry as we know it. Because what has happened is we've made a transaction and in exchange for your big data, which is really what it's about, your big data, your transaction data, the information I now have about your movements and your payments, your lifestyle habits, your web searching, I know more about you than Google. And that's a lot. And I can build a new world and I can gain all the transaction costs that I would have got normally from Visa cards and other things like that. And I can pay for all the technology for free. Now you might say, hmm, never happen. Put your hands up if you think that such a world could happen, could it easily happen in the next 10 years. Put your thing, hands up if you think that could be a world you recognize, okay? Let me tell you this. Put your hands up if you think it could happen in the next five, somewhere in the world. Actually, you all need your hands up. It's already happened. It's history. It's here. It's already here. I'm not telling you the future. You're the futurist. I'm telling you history. You tell me the future. I'm saying it's the changing world. Very dramatic changes. And uh, yes, robotics, we can have a big laugh about robotics. I don't see a great demand for these things. I do see a demand for this kind of robotics. <laughs> but much more interestingly, I, mm, yes, who wants one of these? I'm going to uh, give you, if you uh, imagine I have five pairs of glasses, you have to wear them, you have to promise to wear them on the streets of Paris for one week. <laughs> Put your hands up if you'd be willing to wear a pair of these glasses for one week. Oh my word! Google is in trouble! <laughs> Why? You see, you have the best innovation in the world, but if it doesn't connect with emotion, who cares? You see, Google is struggling. Poor Google. <laughs> Google is trying to find a way to get the data into your brain, which is the real unsolved challenge, and data out. And what they don't realize, it's so simple. All you have to do is put the chip inside the head. <laughs> I'm a physician, I know how these things work. And we have done this already. This is a chip with brain cells growing into it. They are growing on the surface of the chip. Your brain cells are genetically programmed to make perfect connections with computer chips. They need no instructions. They just recognize electrical charge and they connect to it. And they create bandwidth. You can see these little bandwidths, these uh, neurons growing. Put your hands up if you'd like one of these inside your head. <laughs> now, emotions change. That's why market research fails us so often. And you may change your mind too. So never. You may. Generations before have changed at incredible speed. And I promise you this, even if you don't, your children will. 
So we need to listen to our customers with market research when it comes to IT, but we don't believe them when it comes to the future. We take very seriously their observations about our current systems, our processes, and things we need to fix. And then we create a vision in the future, which is what this great USI event is all about. And then we imagine our customers in this future world, and we build a future for them. And I'll just finish with these two faces, finally, rather quickly. Radical. It's about single-issue activism. You only need to look at what is happening in Syria and Iraq to see the power of radical forces. Radical forces, the most biggest radical issue at the moment worldwide is sustainability. Whatever you think about the science, there are huge numbers of people who are passionate about it. And this connects with IT. Did you know that 5% of all global electricity power use is the internet? And it's increasing incredibly fast. So, uh, and then we look at things like the shale gas revolution in the US, which has transformed global gas reserves from, five year, from 60 years to 200 years in less than 60 months. We think about friends of mine who are growing these huge arrays of solar cells in the desert, using mirrors to capture sunlight and transmit it with almost zero power loss over 6,000 kilometers to another country. We're talking about a world where already Solar cells have fallen in price solo using chip technology. These are just silicon wafers, like memory chips. They are so cheap already that you could go and buy the latest ones from a warehouse with using a bank loan and make money on the very first day without any government subsidy whatsoever. China will dominate wind power like it will dominate many other areas of this revolution because China's future depends on clean energy. You know, in Germany, we saw an amazing thing happen last June. There was so much clean energy produced from wind and solar that the grid started to burn up. So the, the electricity companies had to contact all the biggest factories in Germany and other things and say, please turn on everything you have, every factory machine, air conditioning, whatever, electric fires, whatever you have. And the more power you use, the more we will pay. We will pay you five times the normal rate for electricity. We pay you, not you pay us. So electricity became not just free, but a way to earn money. The more money electricity you spend, the higher your income. I'm just saying these are examples of how technology is overtaking strategy and how IT can get left behind unless we have a really big view about where your organization will need to be in the future. Fast, urban, tribal, universal, radical, ethical. Ethical is about fashions and fads. Well, no, it's not. It's about the most important face of the future. It's about the passions that you have. It's about what you believe in your heart is the right thing to do. It's about what inspires you, and this event is all about inspiration, not just analysis. It's about what is really important for our world in future. And I believe that the ultimate and the most important ethical value that any corporation can have is very simple. It's this, only sell to your, to your customer what you'd sell to your own family or your friends, right? Only do things that you really believe in and are proud of. Put your hands up if you think that's true. Life's too short to do things you know are nonsense. Put your hands up if you know that's true. <laughs> it's as we do things that we believe really matter, we sell products that we believe add value, that they're the right price and the right design for those kinds of people. We sell products that we'd sell to our best friend. We operate in a way that we would love to be known for in, by future generations. Then we will have values that really make sense. And I have to say, cutting costs is not a good ethical value. <laughs> okay? You can cut costs in IT in all kinds of strange ways. <laughs> and uh, you won't motivate anybody. But you start talking to people about the things they do for nothing, and then you connect with something different. My wife and I, for, for us, it's, uh, we're involved in an AIDS foundation. We started it in our own home uh, 25 years ago. And we now have programs in Kazakhstan, in Russia, in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Uganda, China, in, in India, in Thailand. Uh, looking to save lives, looking to support children with HIV and so on, with uh, SIDA. Now, 
What is really interesting, you will learn more about each other in this audience in three, in three minutes using one simple test than you will learn in 30 years working with people in the same team. And here's the simple test. I want you to consider in the last three years if you've done something for nothing. You didn't get paid to do it and it wasn't for your best friend or a member of your family, but you just did it. And maybe, um, maybe it was snowing and uh, you cleared the snow from outside your neighbor's house because she is 88 and last year she slipped and she broke her hip and she was in hospital for six months, so you cleared the snow. And maybe, uh, maybe you did the accounts for an orphanage in Zimbabwe. And maybe you uh, help out as a volunteer in the local hospital. Maybe you are too busy, so you have outsourced it. You give, ti you give money and other people give the time. But uh, maybe you climb mountains for, to raise money for breast research. I don't know. Maybe you run around the streets of Paris to raise money for the Red Cross. Put your hands up if in the last three years you have done something for nothing. You weren't actually paid to do it, you just did it because you just felt you should. And I promise you, when you see these hands going up, some of you were too busy, so you outsourced it, you gave money instead. But if you talk to each other about why you had your hand up, why was it breast cancer? What was it about the Red Cross? Why that hospital? Why that AIDS orphanage? You find a story. And you find a story of passion. And I often say this, we can learn so much as IT professionals from the things which happen for nothing. If we could tap into even 2% of that same passion and fire, then you would transform the delivery time of a big IT project, of uh, sorting out a legacy issue, solving a security problem. It's when people are engaged, they understand why it really, really matters, why it really, 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 really will make a better world for the customer to sort this problem out. When they're connected with this incredibly important forward phrase, which is building a better world, which is what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever trend you're looking at, take hold of the future. Either you take hold of the future, or the future will take hold of you. Yes, it's all about emotion, but it's also about changing the future. It's not just reacting to the trend, but it's saying we can use the tools that we have, the budgets and the teams we have, to make our world a better place, to solve customer problems, to improve the quality of life, to save time, to put a smile on people's faces, to create moments of magic, all the way around the world amongst our customers, internally and externally. And as we do that, we will find ourselves doing extraordinary things. Those are the six faces of the future. Thank you very much. I'm looking anxiously at Francois here because I think he, uh, Francois may be going to help me, but I wondered if there are any comments or questions anyone would like to ask me about any aspect of the future. You can go through to the year 2100 if you like. It could be on any topic, any theme, any continent, any industry, and I will try and answer them as quickly as I can. Who would like to go? And you can ask in French too. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, think a, don't you think a between, uh, Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Is there a contradiction between uh, ethical and big data for you? Is there a con conflict between ethical and big data? Yes. <laughs> but the conflict is a different one for every individual. See, my children, I have three children, four children actually, three of them just love to give their data away. So they have huge amounts of big data they broadcast on YouTube, on Twitter. The fourth, he's a professional musician, everything's very tight. He manages his image, he's a very private person, okay? So, uh, but yes, you're right, and as PRISM showed us, I think we can never think again in the same way about big data. What we realize is that even small data becomes part of someone's big data. You might think it's only one little tweet, but someone has sucked it up in some country, and there's probably eight or nine big data databases on which you are, the US, <laughs> Russia, France, Germany, and so on. Yes, huge ethical challenges. I'll tell you the, the real secret here. It's creating magic for customers. So they have to know why. And the way we do it is, is to say, look, the days of just shouting marketing messages at you are over. It's so unfriendly. 
what I want to do is I want to become a, an advisor to you on the journey of life. And now we have signed this wonderful contract uh, with, with Michelle. Um, now we have an intimate relationship. And uh, you, I'm not going to broadcast marketing at you, but I will have conversations with you if that's okay. And you say, yes. And he is, M Michelle has signed a big data contract which allows me to understand Michelle's world and to look over his shoulder when he wants. And so from, you know, he's looking around a marina in Nice. So I send him a message and I say, hey, Michelle, it's about time you and I talked about the yacht. Time to buy. <laughs> Here's 150,000 euros to help you. 2% interest for first year. <laughs> One click. Now, that's, I think, the right use of big data. But so yes, huge ethical challenges. Be very careful what you show your customers about what you can see. Um, I, I was working for a travel company, and um, they, they could see cruise customers typing in their passport numbers in real time. You could, they haven't clicked the send button yet, but they are watching them on the page, each keystroke going in. And they can see the struggle going on. So what you do, you, have, you can see the mobile phone number of the customer, you see their name, address, you know they are trying to book a 14,000 euro cruise around the world, and they cannot complete the form, so what do you do? <clears throat> I'm going to phone them. Say, hello, is that Mrs. Jones? Hello, I can see that you're trying to type in your passport number, you're getting stuck on the letter W. <laughs> Not a good idea, you've just lost the sale. <laughs> okay. But it uh, might be smart to give them a call in five minutes' time to say, uh, but what are you going to say? <laughs> you have to get these messages really, really right, or you will freak your customers out. So ethical problems, yes. Another one, yes. This one here? Mm -hmm. What is the future of, me of media? The future of me media? Media. Wow, what do we mean by media? If we mean by media, do you mean TV, radio? Yeah, okay. The future of media, printed media, is going to live surprisingly long time in some places. I'll tell you why. Uh, put your hands up if you know. Suppose I sent you a 300-page report on the latest hacking threats to your bank. Now, tell me this. 300 pages, and you've got less than 15 minutes before you go into the board to present it because it's arrived late from the consultancy. How are you going to read it? Put your hands up if you know that if you print it out, you'll be able to scan it through in 10 times the speed. Put your hands up if you know that. You see, the human eye can absorb data from a huge sheet of paper at 20 times the speed that it does on a screen, even the biggest HD screen you can get. So it's to do with resolution, contrast, and so on. So paper will survive quite a long time for people who are really busy and well-educated, who can read fast, okay? Um, but uh, uh, broadcast media is becoming do-it-yourself. YouTube, YouTube alone and the BBC uh, iPlayer, just one TV company in the UK, those two are absorbing 70% of all bandwidth in the whole of my country. So actually, if you're in Telco, let me tell you a, a, a whim prediction about media. Forget about all the other services you sell. The only thing worth thinking about is video data. Because 10 minutes of HD video is equivalent to something like 10 million emails backing up. Or 100,000 phone calls. So you can't really go on charging for phone calls and SMSs and stuff. Because they cost you nothing. The only thing that really is taking the time is video. And video is going through the roof. We have video technology which has grown much faster than the ability to generate the content. So we have uh, Hollywood, for example, struggling to make 4K movies. And 4K is already being overtaken. Very short answer to a complex problem. But actually, if you put, if you put that, that web page back up there, there's lots, there's a whole, uh, probably about 100 articles and videos on the globalchange.com website. My, my answers to that media question. Yes, another one. Mm -hmm. What is the future of banks in the Bitcoin world? Wow, what is the future of banks? It, it depends on what kind of banking. Let me just say this. In the middle of the banking crisis, some people, futurists, made some very silly predictions. They said, banks will never have power, they will never make money again, and all kinds of silly things. You know why this is stupid? 
We need banks. As a physician, I know we need hospitals. My wife's a teacher. I know we need schools. We need insurance, incidentally. It's one of the most important things in a civilized world is to insure yourself on risk. But we also need banks. We need strong banks, banks that connect people with wealth with people who want to borrow, that make capital available at low cost, that take the gold that's hidden under the, under the mattress or is worn around the neck of, of, of the poorer women in Africa and Asia and put it in a bank account. We need banks. And banks need to be profitable. Because if there's no profit in banking, we won't have banks, good strong banks. So banks will be allowed to be profitable again. We will see very successful banks again. We will see huge banks again in the future. And uh, so banking, by that I mean consolidation of huge, huge scale financial services. But you will find a awful lot of services in retail that we see delivered at the moment through banks coming out through telcos, is one of my messages. And some of the most exciting innovation will be telco banking. It'll be a fusion between some of the largest telcos in France and some of the largest financial institutions to create whole new ranges of products. Big, a a small answer to a big question. Again, there's a huge section on my website on the, specifically on the future of banks. Um, another question? No more. Okay, fine. I think we need to say goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.